worship at Mount Olive Lutheran Church. A special welcome to visitors that we have with us today. Uh, speaking of which, I am also a visitor. Um, my name is Pastor Ross Chartrand. I serve as part of the admissions department at Michigan Lutheran <laughs> Seminary, and I have with me today the MLS Concert Choir. Uh, they'll be joining us for a number of anthems later on in the service. For right now, though, we'll begin with our opening hymn, number 401. You can find that printed on the inside cover of your worship folder. May God bless our worship together. stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful, and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this, I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sin. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Jesus Christ is Lord of all. Praise be to God. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, whose grace always precedes and follows us, help us to forsake all trust in earthly gain and to find in you our heavenly treasure. 
For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Our Old Testament reading for this morning comes from the book of 2 Kings, chapter 5, verses 14 to 27. So he, that is Naaman, went down and dipped in the Jordan seven times, just as the man of God had said. Then his flesh was restored, like the flesh of a small child, and he was clean. Then he and his whole escort went back to the man of God, that is Elisha. He stood in front of Elisha and said, To be sure, now I know that there is no God in all the earth except in Israel. Now accept a gift from your servant. But Elisha said, As surely as the Lord lives, in whose presence I stand, I will not take anything. Even though Naaman urged him to accept something, he refused. Then Naaman said, If you do not want anything, please give me your servant, as much dirt as two donkeys can carry. For your servant will never again burn incense or sacrifice to other gods, but only to the Lord. But may the Lord forgive your servant this one thing. When my master goes into the house of Rimmon to bow down there, and he supports himself on, and he supports himself on my arm, then I too have to bow down in the house of Rimmon. When I bow down in the house of Rimmon, May the Lord forgive your servant this one thing. Then Elisha said to him, Go in peace. When Naaman had gone some distance from him, Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, the man of God, said, My master was too easy on this Aramean, Naaman, when he did not accept anything that he brought. As surely as the Lord lives, I will run after him and get something from him. So Gehazi chased after Naaman. When Naaman saw him running after him, he got down from his chariot to greet him. He said, Is everything all right? Then Gehazi said, Yes, everything is all right. My master sent me to say, Look, just now two young men from the hill country of Ephraim, from the sons of the prophets, have come to me. Please give them a talent of silver and two sets of clothing. Naaman said, Certainly, take two talents. He urged Gehazi and tied up the two talents of silver in two bags with the two sets of clothing. Then Naaman gave them to his two servants, and they carried them ahead of Gehazi. When he came to the hill, he took the gifts from them. Then he hid them in the house and sent the men back, so they left. Then he went in and attended his master. Elisha said to him, Where were you, Gehazi? Gehazi said, Your servant didn't go anywhere. Then Elisha said to him, Didn't my heart go along when the man got down from his chariot to meet you? Is this the time to take silver, or to accept clothing, or olive groves, or vineyards, or sheep, or cattle, or male and female servants? Naaman's leprosy will cling to you and to your descendants forever. Then Gehazi went out from his presence, leprous like snow. The word of the Lord. Our second lesson for this morning comes from Hebrews 4, verses 12 through 13. For the word of for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to the point of dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow, even being able to judge the ideas and the thoughts of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from him, but everything is uncovered and exposed to the eyes of him whom he will give an account. The word of the Lord. Please stand for the gospel lesson. gospel lesson from this morning comes from Mark chapter 10, beginning with verse 17. As Jesus was setting out on a journey, one man ran up to him and knelt in front of him. He asked, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except one, God. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud, honor your father and mother. The man replied, teacher, I've kept all these since I was a child. Jesus looked at him, loved him, and said to him, one thing you lack, go sell whatever you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. When he heard this, he looked sad and went away grieving because he had great wealth. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it will be for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words. 
But Jesus told them again, Children, how hard it is for those who trust in their riches to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. They were even more astonished and said to one another, Who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, For people it is impossible, but not for God, because all things are possible for God. The Gospel of the Lord. We confess our faith with the Apostles' Creed. I believe. may be seated.
of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The house was an absolute disaster. Pizza boxes stacked from floor to the eight-foot ceilings. Built-in cabinets bursting with all sorts of knickknacks and doodads. Musty towels piled up in the corners. A veritable landfill. You had stacks of decades-old newspapers. Garbage bags filled to the brim with, with musty old clothes no one had worn in also decades. Takeout food containers in various states of decay, covering pretty much every square inch of counter space in the whole place. The house was a disaster. Thankfully, it was all on my TV, and I don't have smell of vision Maybe you've seen the show Hoarders. I think it's on A&E still. Even if you haven't, all you really need to see is one episode. They're all pretty much the same. There's a panning shot of the inside of this house, literally bursting with all sorts of things. And then there's a, a teary interview with one of the homeowner's children. I don't know how they live like this. And then they bring in the uh, cleanup crew, sometimes in not quite hazmat suits, but something similar, dumpsters in tow. And without fail, as they're cleaning up and scrubbing down the house, the homeowner at some point breaks down. Tears. Not of joy, but of panic. Because they can't imagine life without their stuff. Now, I'm not here to criticize anyone on the show. Um, it seems like a lot of them are maybe working through some different mental hurdles. Uh, at the very least, they come from a generation that, that saved things out of necessity. So I'm not here to criticize. Also because if you came to my house and looked in my closets and basement, you might think, oh, not all that different. What's most astounding to me about that show is that even though episode, every episode is the same, really all the people are the same. For whatever reason, all of these people on the show Hoarders, they've, they've found themselves being defined by their stuff. It's become a part of their identity, and they can't fathom life without it, even if they know that life is probably going to be better or at least less cluttered. The rich young man that came up to Jesus in the gospel lesson for today, he, he wasn't hoarding old copies of Time magazine, but he still was very much attached to his stuff. In fact, you could say he was enamored with his pocketbook. As you look at this man coming up, he doesn't seem like a, a man in crisis, but he is. Externally, he looks great. Uh, we're told that he's a, a young guy, so he's got the benefit of youth. Luke tells us that he's a, a ruler, some sort of council member in a local synagogue. He's doing pretty well for himself. Even by his own admission, he's kept God's law well. Jesus asks him, well, have you followed this commandment, that commandment? He goes, yeah, you know, since the time I was a boy. And yet he's in crisis because he doesn't know if he's kept the law well enough. And so he comes up to Jesus with that question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? I clearly haven't done enough. Something is still gnawing at me. What else do I have to do? And that's when Jesus looks at him and loves him and tells him, one thing you lack, go sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. The reaction, the young man's face fell and he went away sad because he had great wealth. And when the man goes away sad, it's not because he has wealth. Wealth itself is neither good nor evil. He goes away sad because it dawns on him. He's kept all of these outward external laws. He hasn't murdered anyone. He hasn't slept with someone else's wife. He's not uh, a liar, a thief. He, he's good on the, the second table of the law. But he has failed in the first commandment. You shall have no other gods. His face falls and he walks away sad and distressed because he has made his goods into his God. This is a shocking moment for the disciples. We're said that they're amazed. And then Jesus carries it on even further and continues to shock them when he says, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man like the guy you see walking away, shoulders slumped, head down, to enter the kingdom of heaven. That's shocking for Jesus' disciples then, and it's shocking, should be shocking for us today. As members in one of the wealthiest countries in the world and one of the wealthiest eras of history, by all standards, you and I 
are just as wealthy, if not more so, than that young man who approached Jesus all those hundreds of years ago. So then our question becomes the same as his. How can we be saved? That's what the disciples ask. That's what we have to ask too. If a man like this, an upstanding citizen, can't get into heaven, what's our chances? The thing is, uh, money, wealth, things, possessions, those aren't really the issue. Those are amoral, right? Neither good nor evil. The issue that we have is an issue of the heart. And it's the same issue that that young man had too. See, by nature, our hearts elevate earthly comfortability over and above eternal blessings. We, and that happens to us with remarkably easy and simple trade-offs. Instead of hearing and learning the different promises that God gives us in his word, well, I've got, got some plans this weekend. Kids have a, a tournament of some kind. It's my one day off. Saturday's pretty full with errands, DIY projects, so maybe not this week. Or maybe we fail to see the needs of our neighbors and, and how we can really easily meet those needs with the blessings God given us, God's given us. And instead it's, uh, well, I want to make sure that my house is in order first, that our nest egg's okay, the kid's school is going to be paid for. The problem isn't the number in our bank account or the number of boxes in our basement. The problem is our sinful hearts that choose to elevate material things over our maker. And just like that young man, they make our goods our God. We're kind of like hoarders in a way, just of the spiritual variety, trying to stockpile all the things that we think will bring us happiness and contentment and finding out that they really just leave us feeling emptier than before, emptier than we would be without all of those things. So our question really is like that of the disciples. How, how can we be saved? Jesus gives us the answer to that as well. He says, with man, this is impossible. But not with God. Because with God, all things are possible. See, we are powerless to declutter our sin-filled hearts. But what we could never do, Jesus stepped in and did perfectly. Jesus, the creator of the universe, the rightful owner of everything we can see and hear and touch, who held everything in his hands, emptied those hands. To be born in the most humble of circumstances. The almighty God humbled himself to become our brother, to live among us and to keep not just that first commandment that we so often fail to keep, but all of them. And all of them he kept for you and for me. And the savior of the world who held everything in his hands emptied them, except for a couple of nails. As he paid the price for our sins of, of greed and idolatry and all the other things we've stumbled at throughout our lives, maybe even this morning. And that's really Jesus' way, isn't it? He empties things so that he can fill them up again. He empties you of your trust in things that you can count or quantify. He empties you of your inborn desire to put your stuff ahead of your Savior. He empties you of the guilt and shame that comes with ever having loved money more than your maker. But he empties you so that he can fill you back up. And he fills you with his grace. He fills you with his perfect righteousness. He fills you with a perfect paradigm shift so that when you look at your worldly possessions, they're no longer a measure of success. They're just a means to serve. A means to serve your God and your neighbor. The amazing thing is this, that what God fills you up with in his word is something that you can distribute and hand out without any worry of running low or running out. Because his mercies are new every morning. And he promises to give you not your weekly, not your monthly, but your daily bread. So even if you lose everything, by flood or by fraud or by fire, you really haven't lost a thing. Because your treasure is in heaven. And in a world that, that overvalues wealth and seeks to hold on to material possessions, store up the right riches. Seek out those wonderful promises God gives us in his word and hold on to them. Because they're already yours. 
freely and fully through Christ, your Savior, who gave up all so that he could give you everything.
please stand for the prayer of the church. Eternal, everlasting God and Father of our Savior Jesus, we come before you with praise and thanksgiving. Our physical and spiritual preservation, we give you thanks. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are all your works. We know, O oh Lord, that we have sinned. Much of the precious time you have granted us, we have wasted in pursuing the wrong goals. become so preoccupied with our selfish wants that we have often forgotten that all our blessings are gifts from you. Forgive us for not using our time and talents and treasures in your service. Destroy the idol of wealth in our hearts. Fill us with the joy of salvation and the riches of your grace. Keep our minds focused on you. We bring these requests, knowing that by ourselves, these things are impossible. And not for you, because all things are possible with God. Hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private petitions. All this we ask in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning once again to you all. Just a, a few announcements here as we close out our worship. Uh, first of all, Pastor Steinke and his family are doing well. Thank you for your continued prayers. He plans to be back in the office on Wednesday. Um, the Moms Group, Mount Olive, Mary and Martha Society, uh, they'll meet Wednesday, October 13th from 12.30 to 2 over in the Parish Center. Uh, we are collecting food for a food drive for Wisconsin Lutheran Seminary. If you could get any donations into church by October 25th, they'll take it to the collection point and they'll drive the big truck over to the seminary in Mequon. Uh, and then finally, there has been a, a meal, a brunch prepared over in the other building. All the, the visitors, choir members, your families are welcome to uh, join in that meal with us. God's blessings on your week.